Hi everyone, welcome back for those of you who are coming back and welcome to all of our new uh, viewers. Uh, I'm Ben Smolin, Principal Flute of the Pacific Symphony and I am so, so, so excited and honored to have Maestro Mayan Chen with us today. Mayan, I'm very to Wow, what do I say to that? You're amazing, Ben. Uh, uh, thank you so much for having me on the show. Yeah, so I, is amazing. I am speechless. Oh, okay. It's very limited, but I try. Um, so uh, just for everybody who's joining us, that uh, clip that we just played was from a Pacific Symphony concert last November. Um, a lot of you, I imagine, probably were there um, when May and Guest conducted us it was a really interesting program featuring not only the music of George Gershwin, like Rhapsody in Blue and American in Paris, but um, also the works of uh, the composer Florence Price. And that was Florence Price's Piano Concerto. Um, and I think that was just a really exciting opportunity for all of us in the orchestra to get to play, something that a lot of us weren't familiar with. 
and with the soloist Aaron Deal, who is great. Um, but also, hopefully, for the audiences who who you know maybe or maybe not had had heard it before. So uh, anyway, that was a clip from that, and we're going to get back to Florence Price in a little bit. Um, but to get started, I just wanted to give everybody a little bit of a rundown about. Uh, Maestro Chen's very impressive background. She is originally from Taiwan and came and studied in Boston at the New England Conservatory, uh, followed by the University of Michigan. And we have that connection because we both had the same, uh, same schools, same order. Go blue. Go blue, yay. Um, and I think, what is the New England Conservatory? The Penguins? <laughs> that, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, Anyway, she uh, has been the music director of the Memphis Symphony. She's now the conductor laureate there, music director of the Chicago Sinfonietta, and also the past music director of the Portland Youth Philharmonic in Oregon. She's also guest conducted an endless number of orchestras around the world, including, of course, the Pacific Symphony. Um, like I said, obviously she was here in November 2019, so very recently, where we did that really interesting American program. and. Uh, even a few years before that, I remember we did Beethoven's Fifth Symphony together, which was also a great experience. Um, so as we get started, just a reminder for everybody, if you have questions or comments, uh, feel free to submit those. There's a chat button that you can use to submit them, or there's also a Q&A feature. So feel free to submit things as we go, and we will you know, incorporate them and also save some time at the end uh, to answer these questions. Um, so while we're on the subject, before we really get started, um, man, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about Florence Price and sort of how you discovered her and sort of what inspired you to include her music on, on, on your programs and like the, specifically the program you brought to Pacific Symphony. Yes, I'd love to talk about Florence Price. Uh, by the way, thank you so much for inviting me and I love your cat in the background. Oh, I know. Uh, <laughs> yes. I that's just, wasabi in the background. Yeah. Oh, wasabi. Oh, that's What's wonderful. Up? And so, first of all, I just wanted to say that coming back to Orange County, working with Pacific Symphony, is always a highlight of my season because of multiple reasons. You know, I love your music director, Carlson Kier. Uh, who has been so supportive of my work over the years. Eileen Jeanette um, is just absolutely favorite colleagues in the, in the country. But also, you know, there are many connections, actually more and easy connections. First one, personally for me, uh, one of your violinists, Ayako, has been with my classmate back in New England Conservatory. That's time. amazing. So it's just so wonderful to be back in Orange County and connecting with uh, such lovely musicians who are wonderful people and um, a community that makes me feel right at home. Uh, this this uh, visit, uh, before I talk about the music, if you, you could allow me to talk about, I'm just in awe being able to taste, you know, the, the best of Taiwan, Ding Tai Fong, right there in Orange County, walking distance from the hotel, and also the, the beautiful glass work from Taiwan. Uh, I, I believe Leo Li is one of your sponsors. And so that put me right back at home. That's as close as I get uh, to being in Taiwan. And, and wonderful new friends I, I've gotten to know Charlie Zen and Ling, his wife, is actually from Taiwan. And so just wonderful um, opportunity for me to be back at Orange County. So let me talk about the music. Florence Price was introduced to me by the orchestra that premiered her work in 1933, making her the first African-American woman composer whose work was premiered by a major orchestra. So that was the Chicago Symphony, inviting me to make my subscription debut in, in 2013 with Florence Price, Mississippi River Suite by the wonderful Martha Gilmer, now is with San Diego Symphony. And you could picture the panic in my eyes when I said, Florence Price, and you know, I didn't know much of, of her music, and it started my own discovery of who is this composer that's been fading out in the history, and then I discover my own NEC connections. She went to New England Conservatory as a young, young, um, incredible musicians in organ, in um, uh, music education, and actually took one of the few students who took a lesson with the president at the time, who was George Whitefield Chadwick. 
And um, that's why Ch uh, Mr. Chetwood's um, uh, composition starts the program. I love the Jubilee from his symphonic sketches. And if you put that back to back for the music lovers out there, if you put Jubilee um, by Chetwood alongside with Dvorak's Carnival Overture, you can hear a lot of uh, similarities because you know um, that we're talking about the, the turn of the century. I mean, Florence Price graduated from New England Conservatory in 1906. Um, and having to conceal her true identity, her mother actually said, just tell your classmates you are from, from Mexico. <laughs> Maybe you, you won't have such a hard time at school. And I find that really sad. And, and also it's interesting to know the history. So uh, the, the piece you just heard, uh, her one movement, Piano Concerto, featuring our wonderful friend, Erin Deal on the piano, uh, was written just one year after she made history, 1934. We're talking about, you know, she, between the 30s and the 40s, she really became a significant composer in the country. Um, and on the same program, we have Dances in the Kimbrick, which was composed at the end of her life, 1953. I think she was capable of orchestrating it. You know, she wrote over 300 compositions combined, you know, for orchestras, concerto, songs. But I think it, she just ran out of time. She had a stroke and passed away. So her uh, childhood friend, they were both from Little Rock, Arkansas, William Grant Still orchestrated the three charming dances that made up um, the dances in the Cambrakes. And so I thought the, the history of how this came together, Eileen has been such a dear friend. And so when I brainstormed with Eileen um, at Pacific Symphony, um, I, def I told her I, I, I would love to bring the dances in the Cambrake to Pacific Symphony to just introduce your community to this wonderful, important composer. Um, and a, a few, few days after our initial conversation, Eileen was visiting New Jersey Symphony, I believe, and witnessed the piano concerto played by Aaron Deal. And so she texted me and said, Maya, what do you think about including her piano concerto? And I said, perfect. I've always wanted to do that work, but very few pianists actually know it. And so from, from the pair of Florence Price works that I thought maybe, maybe we'll just come up with a fun pair of Florence Price and Gershwin because Aaron Deal wanted to do um, Rhapsody in Blue. And so we came up with this fun pair of NEC first half, we're starting with Jubilee and then Dances in the Cambrai and the Piano Concerto. Second half is Gershwin to the, to the full, Rhapsody in Blue, followed by American in Paris. Both compositions written in the 20s when jazz, you know, took over Europe by storm. And I just thought, you know, it's a fun program for the audience. And I didn't know whether the orchestra will love learning new pieces, but you know, I had a great time uh, with the orchestra and it seemed like the audience really enjoyed it as well. Oh, totally. Well, I think that was one thing that, that I was really impressed with was that, like you said, like not only I can speak for the musicians I spoke with, and, and was sitting nearby that everybody seemed to really be very excited about this new music. And, you know, not only was it something new for us, but it was something also very satisfying and fun to play. And then, um, you know, I think it's always sort of a little bit scary when you present new music to, or uh, music that an audience might not be as familiar with because you just don't know what, what people are going to think. But I think that what I was so impressed with was the way that you were able to introduce the pieces and then also the way you were able to situate them with the Chadwick and the Gershwin and with each other, it, it really contextualized everything in a really nice way. And I just thought that the, the reaction was overwhelmingly positive and um, it was, yeah, it was just a really great weekend. So thank you for that. Well, and maybe just one, one more thing for our audience who don't know uh, Florence Price music, you know, particularly the dances in the Kimbrick really was her capturing the indigenous African rhythm. And for those of you who actually hear this, for me, my first impression was, wow, that sounds like ragtime. I, like yeah. Scott Copeland, you know, you know, Entertainment, which was written in 1902. I mean, literally Florence Price was exposed to that. And really, Ragtime was the forerunner of jazz. And so I thought that connection was really neat. 
Yeah. Well, and speaking of that, I think we actually have a clip of the first movement of Dances in the Cane Breaks from your recent CD with Chicago Sinfonietta, which we will get to in a little bit. But I'd love to just show everybody, remind everybody with a clip from that, if you don't mind. Yeah, no, lovely. Great. So let me hope technology uh, cooperates. Amazing. Brings back a lot of happy memories. Yes, fun music. Yeah. Um, so sort of broadening from that discussion a little bit, you know, in terms of how you go about programming a concert when you, when you either, you know, with your home orchestra in Chicago or when you're uh, going to guest artists, you know, guest conduct other orchestras. I'm just wondering like, First of all, what your philosophy is when you go about programming something, whether it's standard or not, and, and how much leeway you get. I've always been curious um, how much leeway you get to sort of just do what you want and how much back and forth there is with a given organization. Um, yeah, I just, I'm curious how, what your experience has been like. Great question, Ben. I think um, with my home orchestra, um, the Chicago Sinfoniata was really funded to embrace um, diversity, inclusion, and equity. And so our programming is very unique in terms of we are always programming outside the box. Um, and it, it, it's, it's fun to always live at, at the edge, if you will. And obviously, when I go to other orchestra, I can't assume the same thing. And depending on how well I know the orchestra. So, and that's why I love working with Eileen, is that she, knows what I've been doing and, and we, I trust her. And so it's easy to brainstorm in terms of, you know, I want to bring things that will work for your community. Every community is unique in its own way. And so um, obviously, the, if you're invited to make debut with an orchestra uh, for the first time, you have 
probably less say just because yes. they probably have the whole season balance. It's like a jigsaw puzzle, um, and and not so much that you you can bring whatever you like. But you know, in in, in the case with Pacific, um, this program, I feel like it was just many heads even. Uh, your music director was involved um, in terms of bouncing back and forth of coming up with a program that's a little bit unusual for your classical series but we took a chance and it was it was nice to know that it paid off um yeah. so our programming at chicago Cincinnati, uh we don't have as many concerts as you guys do we have five major programs a year and so we try to create each one to have uh, a nar narrative theme throughout, whether it's about, you know, Battle of the Bands, which we did with Muka Pata, um, and I, I lost two nights of sleep just trying to figure out, I'm a trained classical musician, how do I put a, a, a hip marching band on stage? Uh. Um, things like that. But, you know, we, we try to really um, find ways to engage younger audience. Yeah, I think, and it's great. And I think it, it's very important too. Um, I was also curious, as you're making these programmatic decisions, do you find that there are different challenges? Whether you, you talked about, you know, community to community is, is different, obviously. Do you notice that there are different challenges programming generally, like for American orchestras versus European versus Asian orchestras, um, in terms of what works to program and and sort of a general philosophy about like, like a narrative flow for the programs? I think, um, especially in America, I think uh, it's interesting to engage the audience beyond the pieces, just because the audience, depending on the city, like our audience are younger group than the diehard fans at Chicago Symphony. And so they're just more open to what we bring to them. They're not necessarily looking for um, the, the me and potato in the repertoire, although that, that's nice to be included so they have a taste of it. But, you know, for example, the Muka Paza uh, collaboration we did, we, we did include the 1812 Overture as the centerpiece, but then we, we did a whole first half of music that has been connections that may not necessarily be um, really center uh, repertoire, uh, like Van Williams, um, um, uh, the written for band, and, and then later orchestrated for orchestra, but we did have like, uh, Britain's young person's guy to set up the battle of the band. But the second half, literally, I mean, if you could imagine my dream come true, sitting in the hall, we perform at the hall of the Chicago Symphony. And every time I go to Chicago Symphony, I'm thinking, how could we make something different? And so my dream came true when the 15 member of the band literally was introduced by coming up the piano lift. <laughs> when the, all the Sousa form merge out of the stage. I mean, they start to hear the band, but they couldn't quite find where they were. They were playing in the piano, let them being lifted up. And the whole audience just went wild, like, you know, uh, a rock concert. And then we did, uh, I can't believe that they even told me, man, we have cheerleaders. <laughs> and I'm like, what do you want me to do with cheerleaders in a symphonic concert? And so, they, we actually take one of the band's music, which has a Klasmer influence, straight into Mahler One. Oh, the wow. The Newman, Farrah Jacques, that has totally Klasmer, right? That's an example of classical repertoire using Klasmer. And so the cheerleaders came out in between the two selections, and they did a cheer on Mahler One. <laughs> I, mean, I wish we have captured that on video. I was mean, just That's to, amazing. to die for. And so, so I think when I program, you know, to, to address your bigger questions, uh, in Asia and also in Europe mostly, I think since a lot of orchestras were sponsored by the government, there's much more uh, programming art for art's sake. I have done a lot more um, premiere on contemporary works uh, in those two continents, uh, just because um, 
it, it's encouraged to really just program something not necessary for sake of the audience, but to really stretch the audience knowing this is important, you know, either a Swedish orchestra pr um, premiering a Swedish work. Um, and for example, I just did Sari uh, the Finnish uh, woman composer as a major composition figure in our days. I just did her violin concerto premiere in Tampere and also um, in Sweden. And so it's, it's interesting that, you know, you see this different environment. Um, however, you know, I, I also think that where you are, Orange County with Pacific Symphony and also Los Angeles has done plenty um, new music and also festival idea, which is really wonderful to be your part of the country. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's, it's interesting. And I hadn't really thought about the whole government funding aspect as sort of having an impact on the programming, but that's a really interesting point. Um, yeah. We have a couple questions related to this. Um, first of all, we have a question from Facebook um, related to programming. Uh, and they would like to know, how do you plan to program for the first concerts when we start getting back after the pandemic, taking into consideration the, the distance of the players and smaller ensembles if necessary. Do you have any ideas already going through your head in terms of what you want to do? Yes, so let me answer this way safely just because we haven't announced our season officially and I, I don't want our new CEO to find out that I announced the season <laughs> <laughs> on, on Pacific Symphony's Facebook event. And so let me answer it this way. We have taken our first concert to be breaking into three three portions. No intermission. However, we are going to feature the orchestras in groups. So we're going to open uh, with a breast fanfare, um, maybe followed by a new commission, um, more of an elegy to really pair with the fanfare. And then we'll bring out our woodwind quintet. There are going to be two groups. So the non-principal player will do a selection and then the principal player will do another selection. Um, the third portion of the concert will be featuring our strings, a reduced string ensemble, um, a little bit smaller than our usual, just to make sure we have enough space to, to uh, meet the uh, so, um, you know, distant, social distancing requirement. And we are going to uh, perform two selections and what I can tell you what's so interesting is that even though we are doing chamber groups, I can tell you more than half of our programming are works by minority composers, um, composers uh, by African Americans and, and Latino composers. And so I'm really excited um, to really share with the world that is, it is possible to still follow our core value uh, to embrace diversity inclusion through innovative programmings and by actually featuring all these composers. Yes, some of them will be sort of arrangers with other pieces, but you know, in this day and age, as orchestras all go smaller, arrangements becomes very important. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think what you're talking about in terms of diversity also is something that we touched on. I was chatting with our principal cellist, Warren Haggerty, last week, and we were talking about this idea that I think a lot of times when people think about uh, diversity in classical music in terms of composers, a lot of times people think that maybe there has to be some sort of a compromise there, but it doesn't have to be. And it can often lead to much, you know, at least as creative and artistically fulfilling programs. And I think that then when you layer on top of that, something like the requirements after a pandemic in terms of reduced ensemble size, it's like, you can look at that as, 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 a hurdle that's going to sort of impact the program or you can look at it as a challenge to make something really creative within the confines of, of what you're what, what you have to do exactly and i think you hit on a point i think as much as i love orchestra be, be growing up as a violinist i miss playing chamber works you know there's nothing that can replace a Brahms sextet for example or a Schubert quintet a Dvorak you know serenade um, that type of repertoire and so I think you're absolutely right that this challenge actually presents an op a unique opportunity 
for our musicians to also enjoy that working closely and, and listening closely, not necessarily distant, but working in this is very more intimate uh, repertoire, but really having to listen to each other so intensely just because we're further apart as an ensemble. And so I think in some way there's this excitement of this unknown um, new reality that we're all embracing. But I think, I think you're absolutely right in terms of embracing it with positiveness um, and try to create something still fun out of this unprecedented time. And I think we will all look back and say, wow, we are all forced to do chamber music. What a great way to do it. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I want to start talking a little bit about you know, you've touched a little bit about on, on your work with Chicago Sinfonietta, and I think it's such an interesting organization because its mission and its, its way of operating is so different than a lot of other symphony orchestras. And I wanted to play everybody a brief clip that you shared with me, sort of like a little taster of, of the Sinfonietta, and then I'd love to come back and sort of hear a little bit about the history of that. Absolutely, thank you. So here we go. Very cool. So um, would you mind just telling us for, for everybody just an idea of a little bit about the history and background of the orchestra and, and sort of what the mission of the Sinfonietta is? Yes, absolutely. Our founder, uh, Maestro Paul Freeman, had a chance meeting with Dr. King as he was arriving at Atlanta Airport to guest conduct the Atlanta Symphony. They have met up, uh, earlier um, during the Nobel Prize that year. And they had a conversation that night that inspired Maestro Freeman to have the idea of starting an orchestra to uh, really help promote musicians of color. And so in 1987, he chose Chicago to be the city to start such um, interesting idea and um, now we are celebrating 30 some years and it's true to our mission in terms of um, the makeup of the orchestra, the makeup of our board and um, staff. It's probably the most diverse orchestra um, in, in North America in terms of um, not only just the, the, the percentage of all these constituencies, but we have consistently programmed uh, if not half, more than half of our season are works by composers of color, which is very unusual. If you see the national analysis, the next um, number two, River Oaks Chamber Orchestra, which I'm serving as first artistic partner, is about, I think, 29% of works by um, composers of color. And so you really see the Sinfonietta being out there in terms of finding works uh, to champion. And it, it's, it's been an orchestra that is so unique um, in the market of Chicago, but also na nationwide in terms of us producing the largest uh, fellows, um, fellows for, of 
uh, diverse background. Um, in fact, 2016, the league did a, a national analysis. And by then, we have about 45 fellows. And now we have even more, 75 fellows, including an, fellows in administration. Um, this year, we're launching our first composing fellow, uh, or uh, conducting fellows, instrumental fellows. So 2016, the league analysis recognized that the fellows produced by Chicago Sinfonietta since 2008, that was when our fellowship was founded, actually was more than the collective number of fellows by orchestras in the entire country. And so wow. I, I just find that fascinating that we are launching, for example, in our, um, I think we launched a conducting fellow maybe around 2014, 15, and we have launched about 10 young conductors in professional positions, including Pacific Symphony, Roger Collier, who just wrapped up his tenure as the associate conductor with the Pacific Symphony, came from, uh, was one of our early fellows. That's amazing. And um, so this, it all falls under this umbrella of the, the Project Inclusion Freeman Fellowships, right? That's right. Um, and, you know, I think it's so interesting. I had obviously heard about the program and I, I was researching it a little more leading up to this week. And, you know, going back again to the discussion that Warren and I were having last week, you know, one of the things we were talking about was that a lot of times when we think about orchestra auditions, they're often considered sort of like the ultimate fair test because you're behind a screen and nobody knows who's who and everybody's playing the same thing. But what it doesn't address in terms of equality is, is everything that leads up to when you walk to that screen, right? So starting your instrument, um, educational opportunities. And I think, you know, there are so many educational, financial, institutional hurdles, especially for people of color and, and students of color as they come through sort of the process of, of going into orchestral playing or composition or even administration, like you were saying. Um, and I think what's so interesting and special about project inclusion is that it seems to really get to the heart of that. And in terms of trying to level the playing field, not just the moment you walk into an audition, but everything that le leads up to that. Um, yeah, absolutely. And um, I was just curious, you know, if you could walk us through, like for an orchestral fellow, for example, who's in Project Inclusion, like what does the fellowship entail? Yes, so there are two major parts of our Project Inclusion um, instrumentalist. They are part of the Project Inclusion Ensemble. So we have them perform, obviously, quartet uh, repertoire in various occasions. We can send them out to community events. For example, they were performing at the inauguration of Chicago Mayor, Mayor Lightfoot. Um, and, and so it was very important for us to be visible in the community. And it's just more flexible instead of the whole orchestra, if you know what I mean. Um, not only that, sometimes they um, perform in other functions. For example, uh, we have them be sort of the guinea pig orchestra for our conducting fellows. Mm. Uh, so one way I can really work with them in terms of um, audition language, how to rehearse the orchestra in an audition, and to really invite an instrumentalist in giving feedback. Could you be more clear? I mean, this is like really safe environment. You, this is not normal. You will never really have that feedback given to you in an yeah. audition process, but it's just, this is creating a very safe and supportive environment where they can hear things that they otherwise would not be able to. And so we try to uh, arrange for mock audition for the instrumentalist. We try to team them up with uh, professionals in our area, sometimes members of the Chicago Symphony, to really help them in terms of, you know, mastering this auditioning um, process, which is a very tough and, and competitive and, and, and it's kind of cold. You walked in as a number, you, you know, and you don't face the audience that's, that's being inspired by your music. And so we try to really think of ways that we can benefit them. Um, for example, Regina Taylor, who was the feature uh, jazz soloist on, on the violin last season, gave a master class. Um, like, how do, how do you improvise on the violin? You know, more getting towards the, the jazz idiom. And we're hoping that we can be talking to 
more major orchestras, such as the Pacific Symphony, we would love to send our fellows to other orchestras to really uh, complement what they receive from us. Um, you know, I talk about there are two parts. I talk about the, the, the first part a lot. The second part is simpler, which is playing side by side with our professional uh, musicians in our orchestra program. So they really get out of uh, performing in um, a professional ensemble. And we will love, since we only have five programs, I, I would love to be able to talk to more professional orchestras to see if we can collaborate and send our fellows to become, here is phase two of their fellowship, yeah. maybe an internship with a bigger orchestra. I think it's a great idea. Um, and I'm curious also, you know, obviously there are lots of benefits for the fellows who participate in the program. Have you noticed um, how the program itself has actually impacted the Chicago Sinfonietta and the professional ensemble? Like, has it, has it had sort of a feedback loop in that way too, do you think? Yes, absolutely. So an example would be, you know, the Grand Park Music Festival. Uh, if you look at my, it's right around here is where <laughs> they perform. Sorry, I, you know, it didn't capture the beautiful, um, very similar to the Disney Hall. Frank Gehry also designed the beautiful venue here. So Grand Park Music Festival only happens in the summer and they started to have sort of their own project inclusion uh, since we run from September to June and they go from more June to August. And out of their um, very first couple years fellowship, they produce a young violist uh, who happened to be African-American young lady. Um, and then we happen to have our principal viola position open just you know, soon, a year or two after she was in the Grand Park um, Project Inclusion Fellowship, and she came to audition for us and won our principal position. Oh, amazing. And so I don't, I think I'm maybe one of the youngest, uh, you know, principal in the country. And she later, just, just maybe last season, she went and auditioned for an open position, a, a, a full-time position with the Grand Park Music Festival Orchestra and won the position there. And wow. she's taking national uh, auditions. And so I'm very encouraged that, that it's, it's, it's feeding, all these programs are feeding one another. And we're hoping that we can help our fellows to be out there and become entrepreneurs, uh, whether it's winning national uh, competitions or to really, you know, for example, one of our violin fellow, former violin fellow, Kyle Dixon, became the conducting auditor this year and has been the music director of the Sao Lu uh, Symphony Orchestra. Wow. And so, um, so it's interesting to see how the fellows sort of find their own way and find their own voices. Yeah, I, I think it's just such a cool program and something that I think would be great as a blueprint for other orchestras who want to sort of um, have something similar, I think it's a great, a great starting place since it's obviously so well fleshed out and so comprehensive. Um, I wanted to also ask you about this, you know, fairly recently, the Chicago Sinfonietta and you received the, the MacArthur Genius Grant, which I just think is so cool. And something that, it, to me at least, has always been a little bit shrouded in mystery and, um, and it's this very exciting award. So I was just curious, like, first of all, how that came about and if you had any sort of inkling that it was gonna happen or if this was like out of the blue. Yeah, you know, the thank you for mentioning that. And we were actually surprised because the Mark Arthur Foundation, they give out these genius grants without applications. You can't apply for it. They send out people all over the world and seek out talents that they, think deserve um, their awards. And so, um, as I mentioned that 1812 overture with Mukha Pata, maybe I will just finish talking about that program. Not only we had the cheerleaders helping us to lead into Mahler One, um, we thought since it's a marching band, maybe 1812, we can create sort of a battle of the field, the orchestra is to Russia you know, protecting its motherland and the Mukapaza invading French army was literally running through the aisles <laughs> in parts of the piece. And then you see some of the members of the, the band come on the choir loft, 
holding baguettes. They ran out of food. That's why they, they were defeated. And at the end of the concert, I think an audience member actually taped two minutes at the end of our concert. You literally see members of Mukha Paza being defeated. They were playing along with the orchestra in front of the orchestra, but literally they die with their <laughs> instrument and literally dead on stage. Now we have to figure out the canon problem because canon is not allowed because of fire code in the symphony center, home of Chicago Symphony. So what did we do? We had 13 shots of confetti cannons. Two, we, you know, Chicago, we're famous for our nosebleed balcony sections. It's very steep. And so two shots for us to aim for the right angle, and then literally 11 shots saved for the performances. You can literally see in that YouTube um, online that the audience member were trying to like, like uh, grab onto those uh. shots into the, into the balcony. And so, um, What's really interesting, two things happen. The first time in my career, I had two more measures to go and the audience could not wait. Everybody <laughs> was like so high at the end of that incredible collaboration. And then the second thing, my creative team at Sintaniata thought about this, we have Battle of the Bands idea, why not match it with Battle of the Beers idea? So before concert, during intermission, and after concert, we have beer tasting. And, and even our musician became so inspired. You know, I can't require musicians to do anything other than playing, but they came to me and said, could we march out like the victors after the band, I said, by all means. So they had a conga line following the band. And so it was one of those, you know, I can't believe we put this together. And so without our knowing, night, uh, the MacArthur Foundation sent, I think about nine people to try to see how we put this together. They probably have the same thought as I was, how is it gonna work? And then six months later, MacArthur Foundation called our CEO uh, at the time, Jim Hirsch, and said, congratulations, you, the Chicago Sinfoniera was going to become the first orchestra to receive the MacArthur Awards for creative and effective institutions. So they, we were awarded $625,000 over wow. three seasons. And so it was just something that we totally didn't expect. So here, maybe an example that when you go, go out there and be creative and innovative, sometimes you get rewarded. That's amazing. Really, really a cool story. Um, are there any um, specific aspirations either because of the MacArthur Award or just in general? Like, I'm just curious what some of your, your goals coming up for the Sinfonietta are. You know, the MacArthur Foundation money was able to help us create the first endowment. And we were able to get a lot of momentum uh, in that, you know, before COVID hit. And so now I think in, in this sort of scary time for a lot of music groups, I mean, we, our hope is that we still get to champion for our mission, which is diversity, equity, and inclusion through innovative programming, universal language of symphonic music. And so our commitment to championing for composers of color, guest artists of color, um, instrumentalists, conductors of color remain the same. And so it's just a matter of, you know, having a very true and unique mission and be able to convince people that is relevant to our community to be able to get enough financial support behind us. You know, I wanted to say this, I know a lot of orchestra out there uh, do have your, you know, community events such as Dr. King Tribute Concert. So I want to talk a little bit about our Dr. King Tribute Concert because for us, um, the Chicago Symphony is very generous to let us have their hall to hold this annual event. And I can tell you that it's to a, a degree that people come no matter what we program. So one year I did a very uh, scary program, l great program that has won the Grammy. It's called Ask Your Mama uh, by wonderful composer, uh, Laura, oh, sorry, uh, her name is skipping my head. I'll look it up right now. And um, it's, it's a program that is 110 minutes long that involves 
choir, narrators, computers, Matt, Laura Cartman, thank you, Eileen, I love you. <laughs> and, and Laura, you know, said, you know, this will be probably one of the other more complete um, premiere since the recording was put together from various group in the country. And, you know, it was during our 30th anniversary. It was one of the ways we said, if we're going to go big on 30th anniversary, let's go big. And, you know, Laura Cartman, I'm not sure our audience is aware of her. We just thought, we just thought this is so important for us to put out um, with with you know the 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 text that's connected to it and so when we did it it was like incredibly high ticket sales uh we pack our holes and so um our hope is that you know we are able to continue um continue you know such mission you know like ask your mama basically it's the multimedia setting of lenston hughes epic poem and we're hoping that we're able to show, as an example, to the rest of the country, when you have a mission and a passion, uh, and, and as you said earlier, Ben, embracing diversity is actually wonderful for in reaching our community. And Chicago is very much that way. And we're just grateful for our diehard fans. And we're hoping that we can continue such tradition and be an example for the rest of the country. In fact, this season, uh, even though it's a, sh a more shortened season we have, we're actually commissioning new works by composers of color in each program. It's hard wow. to imagine us doing that, but our hope is that we can create meaningful works that's reflective of this very unprecedented thing that other orchestra could take and, and also program. Uh, because I think, you know, they're just not such a repertoire out there yet. And I know many orchestra are looking for works by African-American composers, and we're hoping to add on to that repertoire. That's great. And sort of uh, building on that, I want to save some time for questions at the end, but I wanted to talk to you and go back to, to the album that we listened to a little earlier, the Project W. Um, so uh, obviously Project W, subtitle works by diverse women composers. I think it's a great concept for an album and not just the concept, but the actual execution is amazing. And um, I have really enjoyed listening to it. Um, over the past few weeks. And, uh, you know, there's some composers that I'm, I know personally and really love, like Rena Esmile, Jesse Montgomery. Um, obviously there was the Florence Price, uh, a few pieces by her. We've got works by Jennifer Higdon, Clarissa Saad. Um, so I'm curious what the inspiration behind this album was. Yes, thank you, Ben, for uh, mentioning about Project W because um, the, last official concert Maestro Freeman um, had invited, he invited me to be part of that program so he could hand the baton to me. And it was very interesting to me as a young conductor, knowing that one of his last um, act of championing for minority was to champion for women composers. I mean, we think about composers of color being the minority, but if you really think about it uh, two seasons ago, I think the national statistics had less than 2% of the entire repertoire by professional orchestras in America was, um, was works by women composers. And so we took that as sort of, you know, what, what's a good way for us to honor our founder during that 30th anniversary and the musicians and the staff, this sort of just form out of everybody's, what about women composers? You know, like what Maestro Freeman did in terms of his last concert. And so we decided to feature nine works by women composers during our entire season. So it's sprinkled out of, uh, across the five programs and then we commissioned um, uh, several in that in among that nine works, and then we captured five to 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 make Project W be available for other orchestras. So I'm so thankful for Sandy Records, a uh, long history of championing Chicago Sinfoniata uh, with um, uh, uh, African Heritage Series that I 
have used as a wonderful tool when I was assistant with Atlanta Symphony and Baltimore Symphony to really find works by African American composers. But Project W was really a way of saying, we're going to blow the percentage out of the water. And so that year, we were number two in terms of night works out of 20 works of the entire season, only after Los Angeles Philharmonic of 10 works out of 200 some works. But it, if you do it by percentage, we were way up there in terms of championing for women composers. And Jennifer Higdon um, seems to be sort of an obvious choice just because I had a wonderful connection with her out of my tenure in Atlanta, assisting her in the recording of Singing Room featuring Jennifer Coe and Atlanta Symphony Chorus and Atlanta Symphony. And so um, Je uh, Jennifer was so generous for us to be a co-commission on her new pieces for strings called Dance Card. And then we thought, you know, Clarissa Assad, who uh, actually had a study in, in Chicago, but you know, the daughter of the Assad brothers, bring this very interesting South American um, musical idiom in creating a, a piece, sort of a travel log in America, in his uh, in her Sinfonteras, and Jesse Montgomery obviously was just you know um, a composer we have to champion because she's wonderful, and then now she's hitting the radar of New York Phil Project 19 and many other orchestras, and Rina Esmail, very interesting. Through my work with River Oaks Chamber Orchestra, um, one of my favorite ensembles in the country as well, um, was my first chance getting to know Rina uh, through, their, through their commission of the Tim Morty. And so I just find Rina um, being very unique in able to merge the two very different idioms, the Western um, idiom with the a, a traditional Hindu music uh, tradition. And so um, I, I so love Rina's work. I asked her to write something for Sinfoniata and that was when the Me Too movement was just taking off. And so she emailed us and said, you guys might if I change my title to me too. And we were all like, go for it, Rena. And so she created a piece um, with, uh, literally the melodic content was inspired by um, this Indian raga. And, and so she had to demonstrate for our musicians and we just decided, how about you sing it for us and literally capture on the recording. And also very unique about the piece, if you listen to the Project W recording, she had all the women in the orchestra start singing at a particular time in the score, depending on when they joined the orchestra. Oh, and, wow. And, and so our musicians were timid at first, you know, singing is <laughs> not necessarily the strong suit for many, but with, with Rina's encouragement, you know, hopefully you, you get to hear them as part of the piece. Yeah, when we have a small clip, uh, an excerpt from one of the pieces that Rena wrote, Charo Keshi Bandish. Um, so I'd love to play it for everybody so they can get sort of a sampling of, of you know, obviously the Florence Price uh, dances and the cane breaks opens the CD, but then this is a little bit later. And for everybody who's not familiar with Rena Esmail, she's also a local, uh, a local composer here to LA. Um, that's how I've gotten to know her. And she's just fantastic. And so I urge everybody to seek out this album, but also uh, just get to know Rena's music in general. So. Here we go. Oh. 
Wow, that's amazing. So beautiful. Yes. Um, so, uh, like I said, we have left, well, I didn't leave that much time for it, but we do have um, a few minutes where we can answer some questions. Um, if anybody has any for man, we've got a couple in here. Let me just find the chat. And if anybody else has any, please feel free to add them. Um, so we have a question from Facebook. How do you feel about the styles of music evolving post pandemic, pushing composers to avoid typical large scale, scale scores and more towards smaller ensembles akin to neoclassical period after romanticism? Well, let me answer it this way. I think, I, I think we should, we should not assume when it's small ensemble that it can be, that it can be other style than neoclassical. I mean, you know, I can think of Varese, Artandra, Stravinsky, you know, Soldier's Tale. I mean, that's, that's not neoclassical if you, if you think about it. Although I do love neoclassical um, um, genre, don't get me wrong. So I think the fact that we can be smaller, it's maybe great for some of the smaller orchestras that we don't have the budget. I mean, for us to do a Mahler symphony, it's probably once many years budget. Um, and, you know, versus the Pacific symphony, you guys have so many more musicians on the roster. And so in some ways, I think this is an interesting time to create more opportunities for uh, orchestras of smaller size to be able to have repertoire that seems to fit our budget well and I think I think that that you know that there is there there is repertoire out there in terms of arrangements of smaller uh, symphonies um, like Mahler's um, arrangement um, some of the that there are uh, arrangers that I'm getting to know that actually make standard repertoire smaller. So some of the smaller orchestras could do. So I think it's both ways. I, I, I don't think, for those of you who are composers out there, think outside the box. You know, small doesn't necessarily mean all and same. Small could be still innovative. Yeah, I think, yeah, definitely. Um, another question we have is going back to sort of the opening of our conversation. Someone was curious about, we've got Teddy, who is curious about Aaron Deal. And um, did you know him before working with him uh, in November? And sort of, if, if you know anything about his background? Yeah, um, you know, uh, I only knew Aaron through his name, just because he was very much um, a, a recommendation from my management company, Opus 3 Artist, as being a very interesting background, being a jazz pianist, and really also versatile in classical repertoire. And so when I knew about Aaron, it was really tied to this Florence Price piano concerto that he started to champion, which is very smart. Um, and so I, I didn't really know him um, until at Pacific Symphony and just we had a wonderful time uh, such a sweetheart, uh, just easy to work with. And um, I, I love, I think if I remember correctly, even in the Rhapsody in Blue, I think he took some improvisation just on his own, making it different every night. And I don't know I could ever do that, but I always admire people who can. And so I, I love working with him and hopefully there will be other orchestras that will invite him to do Florence Price, Concerto or the Rhapsody in Blue. Yeah. Yeah, great. Well, thank you so, so much for coming and being our guest here. I know this was very exciting for me. I'm so honored that you would, would come. And I think, you know, it's just great for, for everybody who joined. I think it's, it's just such amazing work that you're doing with this Chicago Sinfonietta. And I personally hope you'll be back, you know, as a guest with Pacific Symphony very soon, because I know we all really enjoy working with you. Well, thank you so much. And I love your your wonderful team, your music director, Eileen, um, the, the whole musicians, you always welcome me with such a, such a warmth and, and such artistry on stage. I can't wait to be back. And, and I befriended some of your sponsors who are just absolutely the best people in the country that I still yes. keep a friendship. So uh, my heart is always with Orange County there. And so anytime, I'll do anything, anytime for the Pacific Symphony. So thank Great. you for on the record. <laughs>
<laughs> okay, thank you so much. And thank you so much to everybody who joined us today. Um, and like I said last time, if you have specific questions, follow-up questions, send them along. We'll try to pass them on to Maestro Chen. And if you have any guests that you particularly would like to see in the future, send those along too. Um, and we'll be in touch with the next, the next Pacific Symphony Mixer shortly. So thank you, Mayan. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.